me, but I'm Dr. Matthew Rooney, the research station archaeologist who's assigned here by the Arkansas Archaeological Survey. I run the research station, the Visual Performing Arts Building, and uh, this is the first uh, talk that's been put on by the Tunican chapter of Arkansas Archaeological Society since the COVID-19 pandemic, so we're very happy to have an event like this uh, again, and, 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 it, and it's my first uh, here as a station archaeologist getting it together and getting it planned. Just to give you some information, the, uh, the uh, Arkansas Archaeological Society was formed in 1960 for the purpose of uniting all persons interested in the archaeology of Arkansas and for fostering and encouraging the public's interest in the preservation of the past. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, the School of Social and Behavioral Sciences for taking care of Dr. Boudreaux's accommodations, and I'd also like to thank uh, Kelsey Engler at UAM's Office of Public Relations for helping uh, construct the press release and then also disseminating it to the community. Uh, Dr. Tony Boudreau is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures at Mississippi State University. He's also Director of Curation and CRM for the, for the Cobb Institute of Archaeology. His research has focused on late pre-European contact and contact period Native American societies of the southeastern United States, especially complex societies in the Mississippian and late Woodland periods, which is a lot of archaeological talk. But his, his talk today uh, is a little more recent, he'll, he'll be talking about his search for quote-unquote missing mounds and traces of a 1730 battle at the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians. And after his talk, we'll have questions and answers, so please uh, have all your questions ready and yep. we'll have Dr. Boudreaux start. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> Thank, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight, I, and I didn't realize this was the first sort of post, or I guess we can't say post-COVID, but wherever we are in COVID talk, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of that. Things are starting to feel a little more normal, and, uh, and I'm glad we can all be together tonight. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all about some uh, research some colleagues and I have been doing recently at the, at the Grand Village of the Natchez Indians. Uh, you may have heard of the Grand Village. Uh, it's, it's one of the most sort of important, heavily investigated sites in the state of Mississippi don't know anything about Grand Village, hopefully we'll, we'll remedy a bit of that tonight. Um, it was a very important location uh, beginning in the 15, uh, probably beginning in the 1400s, but certainly in the, in the 18th century, it was, a, it was a critical place for um, interaction between native peoples in the lower Mississippi Valley and uh, uh, French explorers. And so what I'm gonna talk about tonight is um, Ultimately, what we're going to talk about a good bit is a battle that took place at the Grand Village. A battle between the French and between uh, the French and their Choctaw allies. Uh, it's pretty misleading to say the French. There were a lot more Choctaw on the British side than there were French. Uh, between the French and the Choctaw and the Natchez. This battle that took place at the Grand Village in the 1730s. Right, in 1730s. And I'm going to move this chair before I kill you. <laughs> I've tripped over three times. So, uh, this battle uh, is ultimately sort of what brought us to do some research at the Grand Village to see if we could find some locations, uh, some places that were depicted in some, some maps of the battlefield. And ultimately the goal was to see if we could find these uh, locations that were used in the battle and perhaps incorporate those into uh, interpretations at the Grand Village. The Grand Village today is a, a state park operated by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. And let me point out, I've had a lot of partners in this project, and I may not give them all their credit, but uh, uh, they're up here, and if I don't tonight, shame on me. Uh, state park at the Grand Village, but also there's a National Park Service unit in uh, Natchez. So there's a potential to really sort of tie this, the, the sort of the battlefield and what happened, the actual physical landscape of that battle uh, two modern interpretations and uh, help us kind of better understand this pivotal moment, and we'll talk more about that moment later. But one thing I want to point out is that in this sort of research to try to find some of these places associated with the 1730 battle on this battlefield, a big part of doing that involved reconciling these two images that you're looking at here. This is a modern sort of map of, our, of the, the Grand Village, what the Grand Village looks like today. And if you visit the site today, you'll, you'll see on the landscape three mounds, these, these earthen mounds, named A, Mount A, B, and C. Um, these are mounds that we know were built during the Mississippian period. 
They were built sometime between 1300 and 1500. Uh, these mounds were in place, uh, had been built well before the French showed up. Uh, when the French were interacting with the Natchez at the Grand Village, these were the places where the Natchez had their temple. This, these were the mounds where the Natchez chief lived. Uh, the Grand Village was the central, very important place. So if you visit the Grand Village today, you go see that archeological site, see that museum, you will see these three mounds on the landscape. If you look at the 1723 map, uh, uh, this French map of the Natchez region, you will see that there are more than three mounds depicted at the Grand Village. You actually have five mounds depicted at the Grand Village. And that's kind of the, 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 the part of the title of this talk, the miss search for these missing mounds. And finding these mounds were a pretty critical part of helping to figure out the layout of this battlefield at the Grand Village. So what we'll talk about tonight is we'll sort of talk about the process of finding those mounds, talk a little bit about how those mounds got lost in the first place, talk about the process of finding those mounds, the search for those mounds, and ultimately refinding, spoiler alert, we found the mounds, um, <laughs> refinding those mounds helps us to kind of interpret that, reinterpret that battlefield, or actually interpret the battlefield for the first time. But in addition to being able to develop some interpretations about that battlefield, discovering these mounds helps us kind of realize just how kind of complex the history of the Grand Village was. And that's one thing I want you to sort of keep in mind and we'll kind of circle back to. This place had a sort of deep, long, complex history that was more complex than we actually appreciated, which is a little ironic because one thing I also want you to realize tonight is that the Grand Village is one of the best known archeological sites out there. It's hard to imagine a site that's been investigated and documented more than the Grand Village. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, so just a little bit of background about the Grand Village. Um, the Grand Village, like I said, it was, it was initially settled um, prior to contact, centuries prior to contact, probably in the 1200s or 1300s. First mounds were probably built there, ballpark 1400. But the episode we're gonna focus on sort of most tonight is, is uh, sort of the early 18th century uh, occupation of the Grand Village. The French, when they were uh, exploring and colonizing, developing the colony of Louisiana, landed down on the Mississippi Gulf Coast uh, in 1699 as, uh, as sort of colonies and colonists Colonies grew, colonists sort of kept moving into the area. Uh, French footprint expanded up the Mississippi River. And when they expanded up the Mississippi River, the, 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 the most powerful group that they encountered in the lower Mississippi Valley were the Natchez. The Natchez were the central sort of political force uh, uh, there on the, on the lower Mississippi Valley. The Grand Village was the, essentially the capital of this Natchez polity, this Natchez chieftain. So if you're gonna talk about the Natchez people, the Grand Village was, at this time, was the place, uh, was the, the, the political, cultural, religious, social center of the Natchez world. Uh, it was at the Grand Village where the, uh, the, the principal chief of the Natchez Indians lived. Now there were multiple Natchez chiefs, so multiple Natchez communities, multiple Natchez chiefs, uh, but the principal chief, the most important, the most powerful chief, lived at the Grand Village. Um, and we have, uh, we know uh, from many different accounts that were written by these French explorers that uh, the Natchez people referred to that chief as the Great Sun. And the belief was that, that that chief was actually the brother of the sun and the sky. And each morning, one of that chief's responsibilities was to come out and to help his brother rise. Every morning, the sun comes up because the, the Natchez chief is there to sort of help him. And when we did our field work out at Natchez, um, we were there in July. So we were there before sunrise because it was really hot. Uh, so we got to we got to witness these sunrises over Mound B many mornings, and it was kind of kind of awesome and awe-inspiring to kind of think about uh, you know what took place there previously you know, in the 18th century. The Natchez, the, the Grand Village is um, because it was this political capital because the Natchez were so important. French explorers, soldiers, colonists, priests were frequently visiting, frequently living at, uh, at the Grand Village. 
And so we have all sorts of ethno, all sorts of documents, all these historic documents that talk about life at the Grand Village. So it is an extraordinarily, uh, relative to so many other places, extraordinarily sort of well-documented place uh, regarding historic documents. Um, some of the events that we know took place there include uh, the um, 1725 funeral procession of the brother of the great son. Uh, he was uh, he was the Natchez war chief, and this is kind of one of the more famous events that's been documented in these historic documents. It's very elaborate uh, burial ritual. We know from from the archaeology and from the documents um, that uh, we, we we know which one of the mounds was the the mound upon which the Natchez chief lived. We also know which one of the mounds in the Grand Village was the place where the temple is located where when important people died, like chiefs, like uh, the brother of, of the great chief, uh, uh, this brother whose name was Tattooed Serpent, we know that you know, he was sort of, his funeral procession ended up on top of one of these mounds, uh, uh, sort of uh, at the temple that was there. So we know a lot about the Grand Village from these documents. We also know a lot about the Grand Village from archeology. span um, Pretty significant excavations took place at the Grand Village in 1930. Much larger excavations took place there in 1962. Even larger excavations took, there in 19, took place there in 1972. All three of those mounds that I talked about that are visible, visible today, every one of them has been excavated in some way, shape, or form. Two of them have been completely excavated. Visit the site today, those are reconstructed mounds. Um, an extraordinary amount of area off the mounds, kind of out in the plaza area around us, that's also been investigated. Entire houses have been excavated. It's hard to think of a site in Mississippi that's been, that's had more archeological field work than it, uh, at it than the Grand Village. So we've got all this documentation from the, the historic accounts, and we've got a lot of archeological investigation that took place there as well. Grand Village today, um, so, so it's really, a, Grand Village was really important in the early 18th century as this political capital, really important archeologically because so much work has, been, has taken place there. Grand Village is also very important today. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a state historic site uh, in the state of Mississippi operated by uh, Mississippi Department of Archaeology History. Um, and it's the, the goal of the Grand Village, the museum and the interpretation there are basically to present uh, sort of information about Natchez. Um, it's easy to go to Natchez and visit Annabelle Holmes and sort of get sucked into um, that aspect. And that's wonderful. There's, there's good stuff in Natchez to go see that. Uh, but the role of the Grand Village today is to present the story about the, Nat the very first people in Natchez, the Natchez Indians. And one really cool thing is that um, tonight we're ultimately going to talk about the Natchez being driven out of their homeland. Um, when the Natchez were driven out of their homeland, they did not disappear. Uh, they did not. Uh, they did not all uh, uh, awful things happen to many Natchez people. But some Natchez people survived, persevered, and are, are, uh, their descendants are still here today. And uh, Grand Village is a place where some of those descendants actually are still able to come and participate in activities, the uh, modern activities at the Grand Village. So it's kind of a kind of a neat story. And just a total sidebar here. Uh, these are my these are my kids here from playing stickball with the, with the Natchez descendants. And I was we were there a few years ago, and I was like, how freaking cool is this? My kids are at the Grand Village of the Natchez Indian playing stickball with with, with Natchez descendants. So uh, kind of good stuff. Um, give you a little bit of background, sort of leading up to this battle. Um, the Na the French could not have done anything in the Lower Mississippi Valley without Natchez permission, without Natchez blessing, without the Natchez as their allies. Um, so there was this approximately kind of 30 year relationship between the Natchez and the French in the Lower Mississippi Valley. That was a rather tumultuous relationship. It was, um, you basically had two very powerful entities kind of dealing with each other. And, and at times the, the, the interests of the French and the Natchez aligned, and at times they did not. Uh, one thing we ultimately see, one thing we see in Natchez, one thing we ultimately see in virtually every colonial situation, though, is that there's a period of overlap between colonial powers and native peoples, sort of with mutual interests, that ultimately 
the, the, there's an imbalance in the, in the colonial powers. Uh, the, the, the interest of the colonial powers far outweigh the interest of, of, the, of the native peoples and the ability of the colonial forces, powers, to basically exert their will when there are these, when there are these differences. That ultimately, in almost every single case, the, the colonial powers are able, to, um, are able to sort of exert their will upon native peoples. And that's ultimately what happened with the Natchez. So just to give you a little bit of background, you can see this timeline here. Um, uh, and this timeline goes from when uh, French colonists first arrived on the Gulf Coast, first kind of establish uh, a fort, establish uh, sort of con some constructions in the Natchez area. And you see kind of sprinkled in here multiple Natchez wars. So there were multiple conflicts uh, between the Natchez and the French over the years. But the, the, the sort of the, the major conflict, the conflict that kind of led to what we're going to be talking about uh, tonight is the 1729, uh, the French refer to it as this Natchez Rebellion. And that's when the Natchez, uh, uh, basically, they had had enough, and there was this coordinated effort uh, among multiple Natchez people to attack uh, two French settlements and a French fort that, is that were located in Natchez territory. And what happened is that, uh, casualty estimates vary pretty significantly, but approximately 150 uh, French colonists, French soldiers were killed a number of French women and children were taken captive. A number of enslaved Africans, uh, the, the, the French had uh, these enslaved people that uh, were, were owned by the French, they were also sort of taken captive by the Natchez. The 1729 uh, uprising, at least temporarily, drove the French completely from Natchez territory, which is what the Natchez wanted. They wanted to be shut of the French, and at least temporarily, oops, they were able to be. However, um, almost immediately, as survivors were able to sort of make their way down to New Orleans, almost immediately the French started planning a punitive expedition to, to, to attack the Natchez. And ultimately, just not, not ultimately, just a few months later, um, the Natchez were able to, uh, I'm sorry, the French were able to convince the Choctaws to, to partner with them, to be their allies, and to attack the French, I mean, attack the Natchez. The Natchez, fully expecting this retaliatory attack, had prepared themselves. And one thing they did <clears throat> was to build two wooden forts nearby the Grand Village. So just, just to kind of give you the lay of the land here, this is actually a map of the battlefield that was drawn by, we don't know by who, but it was drawn by some French engineer, soldier, colonist who participated in the battle. So this is basically a battlefield map. Uh, from, from the, um, uh, presumably from sort of immediately after the, the conclusion of the battle. And just to kind of use this map to orient you, the Natchez had built two forts, two wooden forts nearby the Grand Village. This is the Grand Village here. When the Choctaws arrived first, uh, they kind of caught the Natchez unaware, and the Natchez immediately sort of retreated into these two forts, uh, which was a pretty smart move on their, uh, on their part. The, the, the Choctaw, and then later when the French arrived, they, could, they couldn't penetrate the walls of these forts. So these, these were safe places for the, for the Natchez. The, the French documented the names of these two forts, uh, Fort Farine and Fort Velour. And, and let me sort of point out these, these maps, all of this information I'm giving you from these maps comes from uh, my colleague, Ben Stephanidis, who's an archeologist at the University of North Carolina. He's been working, he's been working in the Natchez area for years and he's been working with these maps, uh, and, and his work was, was a critical part of, uh, of uh, what I'm talking about tonight. But the names of these two forts are pretty interesting, <coughs> and Ben was able to sort of figure out, um, Valour is a, a term that the French used to refer to the Natchez. Um, Valour, or rather the Natchez who live in the Grand Village. Valour is a term that means grand, special, I don't speak with a name like Boudreaux, you think that would be different, but I don't speak Boudreaux. <laughs> Lore basically means sort of special. Uh, uh, and so that was the term that the uh, French used to refer to the Natchez who were living at the Grand Village. And the term farine translates as flour, like, like bread flour kind of thing. And so what Ben has argued is that, and, and farine was the name of a Natchez settlement. 
And so what Ben has argued is that basically these forts were built by different Natchez people who were living in different towns. And so each town had their own fort. The Grand Village had its fort, and the, 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 the flower town, uh, Perrine, had its fort as well. So these, these folks were going to this fort. Choctaws uh, attack the outside of the fort. They can't breach the walls of the fort. The French show up, they start, and when the French show up, they actually occupy the Grand Village. So that's kind of an important thing to keep in mind. The Natchez leave the Grand Village, go to their forts. The, the French occupy the Grand Village. And we know from the accounts, we know from the maps, they actually use a, they use a couple of the mounds at the Grand Village. One of the mounds, uh, they set up, uh, they, they occupy some of the buildings on top, and they use it as a field hospital. Uh, one of these maps talks about the wounded sort of being, uh, the injured being in one of these, on top of one of these mounds. Another mound, they put two cannon on, uh, and so they have this, this, this sort of, uh, this battery of two cannon on. And you'll see um, extending from this mound that had the cannons on it is a trench. This is, this is actually sort of a, a trench. And this trench is a, a sap. Siege warfare was something that sort of all European powers had been sort of, uh, uh, sort of involved in for, for many centuries by the time this battle took place. And it was, it was kind of a standard thing. There actually are books you can look at from the 18th century, like instruction manuals, how to lay siege to a fort. And part of the instructions are to dig a trench towards, towards the, the, the fort. And the way this works is you start outside of musket range, outside of cannon range, and you, so your, your people digging the, the trench, your sappers, they're safe. They start digging a trench. They kind of go semi-subterranean, maybe dig, dig about three feet tall, but then all of the soil that comes out of that trench goes on the fork side of the trench. So you've got soil between you and the people that are trying to kill you. And the idea is that you dig this trench close enough so that you can get your cannons in place to be in range so that you can bombard the fort, breach the walls, send in ground troops. And at that point, it's, it's basically game over. Um, and you can see there are these little sort of zigzags in the trench. And that's so that if, uh, <clears throat> if any enemies get into the trench, um, if you think about it, if you had a long straight trench, they would be able to sort of shoot down the entire trench. So the zigzags sort of prevent uh, a, a basically a, a one part of the trench being compromised being breached and the entire breach, entire trench being compromised. And you can actually see these little sort of uh, jags that go out to the side. And that's where folks, they would have set up muskets to kind of protect the sappers while they were digging the next section of the trench. February 25th, the, the French are able to get their cannon within range. That they dig the trench far enough to get their cannon within range of the fort, and the Natchez realize this. They know that this is, this is we're coming to the end here. And so at that point, they start to negotiate with the French. They start to parlay. Uh, they release all their prisoners under, they say they'll release their prisoners if the Natchez will pull their, uh, their cannons, I mean, if the French will pull their cannons back. The French agree to that. The Natchez release their prisoners. The Natchez say they're gonna surrender themselves the next day. They don't. Uh, on the night of the 25th to the 26th, the Natchez disappear. They actually slip out of these forts, cross the Mississippi River. And so when the, when the French and the Choctaws actually take over these two forts, the, the Natchez are gone. And what this did ultimately is it bought the Natchez about another year because the same situation played out about a year later. Uh, the Natchez uh, slipped across the Mississippi River, uh, went about 40 kilometers to the north to Sicily Island, Louisiana, and eventually the French found them there. The Natchez had constructed another fort. Similar situation played out except this time when the Natchez uh, surrendered, those that surrendered, um, let me back up a little bit. Many Natchez surrendered, hundreds of Natchez surrendered here on Sicily Island. Those Natchez were taken by the French to New Orleans. Some of them were um, executed in the public square. Most of them were actually sold as slaves to sugar plantations in the Caribbean. Um, those Natchez that did not surrender, many of them escaped. And some of them ended up going to, many of them ended up going to live with the Chickasaws in northeast uh, Mississippi. Some of them ended up going to North Carolina and South Carolina, living with the Cherokees. Uh, some ended up living with the Creek. Uh, some actually sort of escaped and kind of stayed in the Natchez area. They were just kind of these 
uh, these these um, uh, just kind of marauding band for a while, attacking uh, attacking the French and attacking French Indian allies. The important thing to take away from this is that even though the Natchez didn't disappear as a people at this time, they, they, they ceased to exist as an autonomous independent group. And when they were driven out of their, uh, driven out of their forts or actually retreated from their forts at the Grand Village, they ultimately were leaving their homeland at that point. So an important part of kind of looking at this battlefield is to try to put this, this conflict, which was the the moment when the Natchez were driven from their homeland, this most powerful group in the Lower Mississippi Valley was driven away. That's kind of one reason why we're, we're sort of wanting to look at this battlefield to put that moment, that event, uh, in, into sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, into uh, bring it into sort of can be sort of incorporated into modern interpretations of the site. All right, so the missing mounds were finding the missing mounds were sort of a critical part of us looking at this battlefield. Um, ultimately, what we wanted to do, and what, what uh, our colleague at North Carolina, the University of North Carolina, Ben Stephanides was able to do was to kind of take these battlefield maps. There were two different battlefield maps. And he was able to sort of do the best he could to kind of use features that are depicted in those maps that are also still visible on the landscape today to try to orient those maps. And two of the most important things he used uh, were, were uh, two of the mounds that are still visible on the site today. And he was able to sort of basically sort of jigger those maps around as good as he possibly could, basically having two or three points of, 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 to orient them. And ultimately, what we wanted to be able to do was to try to use those maps to see if we could locate as many parts of this battlefield that might still be preserved. Could we find the sap trench? Could we find the locations of those Natchez forts? Uh, and if we could, you know, sort of, uh, uh, that would be sort of a, a, a pretty tremendous thing to do. So we were able to get a grant from the National Park Service, this, this American Battlefield Protection and Preservation Grant, that allowed us to basically explore this battlefield to see if any of these features from this, this 1730 battle were, were present. The two most important things we, we wanted to try to find first were these two missing mounds. Remember I mentioned before, if you go to the site today, you can actually see three mounds on the surface, but these battlefield maps depict two additional mounds, two, these two missing mounds. And these two missing mounds are pretty critical because one of those missing mounds is where the French set up their cannon, and, and, and then from the foot of that mound started digging that sap, and then the other missing mound was one of the mound that was used for housing the um, uh, wounded. So these two mounds played a pretty critical role in the, um, uh, in the battle. So finding them was, was kind of a, we thought sort of a, a critical part of what we wanted to do. One thing you may be wondering is like, how do mounds go missing? Um, the Natchez area, you're probably much more familiar with sort of the, the, the history, the antebellum history of Natchez, where cotton was, you know, sort of the, 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 the primary crop and wealth from cotton and enslaved people <coughs> brought in to sort, of, uh, to, to sort of take care of the cotton. That's such a huge part of the, of the uh, 19th century uh, economy and history of Natchez. Part of that process when, when cotton became so valuable in the early 1800s, essentially every bit of land in Natchez was kind of turned over to cotton production. And if you've ever been to Natchez, it's pretty hilly there. Um, there's, there's areas that probably ought not be agricultural fields. And so what you think happened is that there was all this, basically all this erosion from these, all these forests being cleared, um, all this erosion. So you end up with all this silt getting into these waterways and then as um, creeks and rivers you know, sort of flood in the spring and deposit that silt, this extraordinary amount of silt essentially covered the entire location of the Grand Village with uh, up, to, up to six feet of, of silt. And we kind of know that it's happened because those excavations I mentioned that took place in 1962 and 1972, the archeologist who went there, he saw these, the three mounds kind of sticking 
three mounds on the surface, or what he thought was the, surf, the ground surface. Uh, and so when he did excavations there, what he realized is that those mounds were actually, the sides of those mounds were actually deeply buried under this approximately six foot of silt. And all of, the only reason he was seeing those mounds is that they happened to be taller than six feet when all this silt was deposited. Um, and if you go to the site today and you sort of see those three mounds that are visible, one reason they're visible is if you, if you look at that image up there, this is a LIDAR image, you can kind of see this darker oval here that's surrounding the mounds. In 1972, uh, one of the archaeologists brought in all of this earth moving uh, equipment from the county, uh, uh, um, uh, road graders, bulldozers, and basically he stripped off that six foot of silt that was surrounding those three mounds so that he could get down to that deeply buried original ground surface. And that's how he was able to find Natchez houses and uh, all, of these, all of these surfaces that were occupied in 1730. Um, if he hadn't done that, you know, there'd have been six feet under the ground. So when you go to the site today and you see these three mounds, you say, oh yeah, there's, uh, there they are, but they're actually sitting down in this basin. Somebody's already scooped all that silt out from around them. And so all we can sort of assume is that those missing mounds, they were shorter than six feet tall. And so that whenever they, whenever that silt came in, they got completely buried and forgotten. And so our colleague at the University of North Carolina was able to sort of use, um, use the maps to come up with a pretty good sort of, pretty reasonable search area to see if we could find these missing mounds. And fortunately for us, <laughs> the location where those mounds probably was gonna be based on his map research was actually part of a state park. So it was, um, we, were, we were able to sort of have access to this area. And also fortunately for us, the area that possibly had those mounds uh, located in them had not been developed yet. You can see, uh, you know, sort of modern development has come right up to the edge of the, of the, of the, of the park. And so if you look, um, and just to sort of give you a sense of what the landscape looks like today, that photograph up there, I took from the, uh, you can't really tell from this area photo, but these are, these, are, these are the three mounds that are visible today, mounds A, B, and C. I stood on top of Mount B and took sort of a photo, that photo facing this direction. And those two sort of missing mounds, possibly are out in this area, but when you look at that big open field, nice and flat. No, no evidence that there's anything going on there, just this sort of nice flat area. So how do you sort of investigate archeologically something that's deeply buried? Uh, fortunately, I had a colleague, and uh, I, I was actually at the University of Mississippi at the time. Um, I've jumped ship since then. Um, but I had a colleague at Ole Miss who was uh, um, uh, proficient in using uh, ground penetrating radar. radar. Uh, and so we turned to ground penetrating radar because it's one of the few sort of uh, remote sensing instruments that can actually go relatively deep. Uh, we have a lot of options for doing remote sensing, um, but most of them penetrate, you know, relatively shallow, you know, maybe from, from sort of here down to the ground. GPR can actually go very deep, it sends these, these, uh, uh, these, these radar pulses sort of down into the ground. Those radar pulses either bounce off of something hard or they bounce off of sort of soil changes. You know, these basically just kind of transitional zones. And when that signal bounces back up, there's a, there's a receiver in that GPR that actually sort of is able to sort of figure out um, how long it took that signal to go down and bounce back. And that kind of tells you, gives you a sense of depth. And then all of those different sort of data points can be used to reconstruct kind of a, a, a give you a visual sense of what might be buried underneath the ground. And just to show you some of, the, some of the results we got from surveying this area, um, and you can look at different depths. This is a relatively shallow sort of ground penetrating radar image. This is a deeper ground penetrating radar image. And if you're looking at this and you're thinking, I don't see anything, I'm with you. Like I, I had my colleague at Ole Miss that he showed me this stuff and I was like, and he said, don't worry, I got something. So anyway, just to, there are certainly some things you can see. You can see modern utilities sort of running through the survey area. So we knew the thing was working. But just to sort of focus on, there's kind of an oval here. I'm going to use the cursor. It's kind of a, it's 
not showing up on the screen. Oh, the cursor is just, oh, sorry. Probably even the first row. Yeah. Easier. <laughs> <laughs> the oval right there. And my colleague said, I think that's a, I think that's a thing. Let's look at that. I said, all right, I'm going to trust you. You're the expert. One sort of interesting part about uh, that, that thing that he thought he saw on the radar that actually did turn out to be something. Um, when we sort of, when my colleague at uh, University of North Carolina had sort of laid the French maps down and, and tried to sort of realign them with modern landscape features, there's two French maps. They're not, they're not 100, they don't like exactly match up with each other, so we had multiple options for where these mounds could be. But two of the options for where those, where the, where that, one of those missing mounds could be was pretty close to that, that anomaly, that strange looking thing, and I thought, man, Okay, looks, looks good enough, good enough to try. So we had this target, we had this, this, this anomaly that was indicated through the ground penetrating radar. What do you do next when you got something that's deeply buried? We had some colleagues from Louisiana came over with a coring rig, and they had this truck mounted coring rig that was able to sort of send down a, a, a core that could pull out sort of a two inch core, and our colleague was able to sort of, you could feed sort of multiple sections into this thing so that this coring rig could ultimately go down about four meters in depth. You know, so this thing could go down pretty, pretty far. Certainly as far as we need, actually could go farther than that, but that's, that's the extent of what we did. And so we cored in this area uh, where, this, where this anomaly had showed up, and what we were able to see was that it, there were places where there was the, the sort of six feet of, of silt that we expected to be there but there were places where there was much less silt. And that, 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 that less silt was sitting on top of what looked like mixed soil that presumably was from the construction of a mound. So if you think about building a mound, you get soil from somewhere else and pile it up to build the mound. And so we were seeing this sort of soil, these silt layers on top of these mixed soil layers. And, and sort of the, the key thing, sort of the tell was that as we did these cores across this space, the layer of silt sort of got thinner and thinner. And so what we thought we were looking at was basically the slope of a mound. Uh, the deepest was the original ground surface, then as you went up the slope, um, we, we thought we were sort of going up the, uh, up the side of a mound. But you gotta keep in mind, we're doing all this by looking at two inch soil cores standing on a flat surface. So you're kinda like, oh, okay, maybe, I hope so, I think so. Um, so we kind of had a target area to then focus some excavations on. And it was through these excavations that we were able to confirm that we were indeed standing on top of one of these missing mounds. Um, and so we brought in a, a, a small backhoe because we knew we had a significant amount of just silt that was relatively modern to pull off of there. So we pulled that off, cleaned the soil up uh, with shovels, and what we were able to sort of get into was a, a uh, one of those missing mounds. Um, it was really kind of one of these things where um, sometimes it's better to be uh, you know, lucky than good, and we were, we, were, we were lucky this time. We were able to sort of figure out that, um, uh, and what, just sort of show you what we're looking at here. All of this up here, this kind of lighter brown stuff, that's the silt. So you've got a layer, layer of silt sitting on top of this mound but you can see some sort of more regularly mixed soils through here. So I'll actually start at the bottom. This is kind of the original ground surface. You know, so this was probably uh, you know, sort of what the mound started to be built upon about 1400 AD. Right here, this is your first kind of layer of mound construction. It kind of caught a corner of the mound. That mound layer sort of goes up. It would have had a nice flat summit up here. This layer here, kind of this wedge right here, is this really thick, rich trash deposit. It's, it's this mid layer that was absolutely full of fish bone. I mean, fish bone with extraordinary preservation. Gar scales, actually fish scales. Fish scales were preserved in this thing. Tiny little vertebra with all the little sort of pointy parts on it. Um, Lots of pottery, lots of fish remains, lots of charcoal. Looks like there was just some kind of event that took place on top of this mound and then all that trash was thrown sort of down slope. And then we've got another layer of mound building on top of it here. So we, 
we got one of those maps, um, uh, and, and it was sort of this stage thing, GPR coring and then the excavations. Got that first map. Um, kind of go through this pretty quickly. Once we got that first mound, we had a much better sense of where the second mound should be. So we had sort of a much smaller area to search in for that second mound. And that second mound did not show up in our GPR. Uh, I, I can sort of talk about that later, why, why I think that might be the case. But we, we couldn't see it in GPR, but we decided to go out there and do some more cord. Because once we had three of the mounds on, that were depicted on the map, we had a pretty good sense of where that, that fourth mound should be. So we went out there with a, with a core um, that was, uh, we were able to sort of get about three meters worth of coring on it and sort of systematically cored across this area. And we were able to once again find a situation where you had the silt sitting on top of these mixed layers of fill that looked like uh, layers of mound construction. So we couldn't see it in the GPR, but we were able to find that second mound. So we're, we're two for two on mounds. We got both of, our, both of our missing mounds. Once we found that second mound, and we were able to kind of more precisely orient these trench maps. So think about it now, we don't just have uh, two of the known mounds, we now have basically we have four points to kind of orient these maps we were able to kind of project where we thought that Sapper's Trench might go. Um, because we knew from the French maps, it started near the base of Mount E, this northernmost mound, that French sap looked like it went straight underneath this neighborhood. And so, how do you survey a neighborhood? Um, well, we found basically a stretch of road that was relatively straight and our partner at, uh, at, the, uh, at the Grand Village, the director of the Grand Village, was able to reach out to folks in this neighborhood and to a person, they all said, sure, come on. Can we start right in your front yard? Sure, right, sounds good, no problem. You know, I fully <laughs> expected somebody to say, no, are you crazy, get out of here. Um, they were like, yeah, whatever. Um, so, so they were kind of great. And, and we had no intentions of digging, you know, and so, so it really was. We kind of showed up, did our survey, left, and there's you know, sort of no trace archeology, span no sign we were ever there. So we were able to do this GPR survey in an area where we thought the trench might be. We were not able to see any evidence of the trench in the GPR. So that's kind of a, kind of a bummer. So we weren't able to confirm its presence, uh, but I'm still pretty confident it's, it's, it's in there. So just to kind of quickly go through some of, the, some of the results, some of the conclusions, so I can leave at least some time for, um, for any questions you might have. I think one of the big conclusions from this is that even though this landscape has been significantly modified since 1730, there still are intact features from this, from this 1730 battle uh, that, that are there. So you can actually interpret and talk about this battlefield. Now, if you go to the Grand Village, you can't see these mounds. You gotta trust us that they're, that they're, they're present, but those features are there, so they can be developed into interpretation. And as I understand it, um, they've actually developed um, uh, some, some cell phone apps using virtual reality so that you can sort of stand out on the site and point your phone at where those mounds are buried and see sort of a representation of those mounds. So you can actually see them on the landscape, even though that 1730s landscape is six feet below your feet. Um, so we were able to find evidence of the two, two missing mounds. We could not confirm the location of the trench. However, I'm pretty confident uh, with, with the, the four mounds that we have that we've got a good sense of where that trench is. And quite frankly, that trench is probably deeply buried and mostly intact underneath that neighborhood. Um, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be. The two Natchez forts, we, we, they're sort of so far away, I don't think we can really accurately kind of project where they are. But when we do project where they, they, they possibly could be, it, it doesn't look good for their preservation. Um, it, uh, it's, it's quite probable that this creek has kind of eroded at least one, maybe both of them. It's also quite possible that at least one of these is, is kind of underneath a highway and a parking lot that, that probably sort of boogered them up. But if you think about it, these forts were relatively short-term occupations. I don't know how much of an archaeological signature they would have anyway. Uh, but it's another situation where you could use these maps, use the two known locations of the mound, and at least project where they could be and, and develop those as interpretations and develop those as uh, basically reach out to the city of Natchez and other folks and say, hey, be aware, you know, if there's any development in this area, sort of watch out. 
Um, other results, uh, one, one important result is that the, the, the history of the Grand Village is much more complicated than we ever thought. Um, for the last hundred years, we've interpreted this site based on the presence of three mounds. Well, guess what? There's, there's four or five. You know, there's, there's more than three. Uh, here's the crew basically pointing to the map that's at the site saying, hey, here, there's a missing mound there. So this, this history of this site is much more complex than we've been interpreting for a very long time. And kind of our, our challenge now is to kind of uh, incorporate these new mounds into this history. Where do they fit? How, how are they used? Uh, um, and our, my colleague, uh, uh, Ben Stephanidis, at least based on some of the information that's presented in those French maps, has some sort of uh, interpretations uh, based on observations that the, that the, that the French who were there made. For example, they call one of the mounds uh, the Old Temple. Um, so there was a new temple, or actually rather a currently used temple in 1730, but one of these mounds is referred to as the Old Temple. So what does that mean? You know, how, how does that sort of play out? Uh, what does that mean for understanding the history of the Grand Village? And we're, we're certainly sort of the beginning of trying to figure out something like that. One sort of, the, the, the one I want to sort of end up on so as far as conclusions is that our experience at the Grand Village gives me pause, and hopefully it sort of gives you pause too. Um, it's kind of a cautionary tale about the incompleteness sometimes of, of historic documents. Um, this is one of the best documented sites as far as historic observations go. People writing things, people visiting who had written language and writing things down and those documents being passed on to us. We have an extraordinarily rich amount of information about this site. And look how incomplete our information was based on those documents. Um, there is no mention whatsoever of any of these missing mounds in these French documents, even though some of those French maps actually, actually show buildings on top of those mounds. So those mounds were being used when the French were there, but they didn't write anything about them. Um, um, so, so, you know, so, so that's kind of a cautionary tale for us of like maybe putting too much uh, emphasis. Not saying we don't use the documents. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it's it's kind of a um, it's kind of a cautionary tale for for sort of the limits of our knowledge. And also in an archaeological sense, this is one of the best known sites uh, in the region. Uh, and look at what we, we didn't know about two entire mounds. I mean, how do you, how do you, you know, how, do you, how do you justify that? So there's a lot that we don't know. And I want to sort of conclude by saying that. I really want to emphasize how much we don't know. And I'm not saying that in a negative way at all. To me, that's kind of an exciting thing. Now, here's a site you can maybe look at and say, eh, we've done so much work that we kind of got it all figured out. No, there's still some very basic things we don't know about this. So this is kind of the fun to me, part of the fun of archaeology is that's why you sort of do some of these excavations. You really don't know what you're going to find. Um, and so uh, with that, I want to acknowledge all of the folks who have sort of contributed to this research and um, open the floor for any questions you might have. So um, these Native American mounds are notoriously mysterious. Um, were you able to determine the original function of these mounds other than to provide elevation for important structures? So the, the two missing mounds in particular, no. Like, like right now, uh, we don't really don't know what they were used for. The, the, the three mounds that we know about, that, were, that have been known about for a long time, their, their functions are pretty well known from archaeology and from the historic records. Um, mount C, the, the southernmost mound there, it was the platform upon which the Natchez Temple was built. So it's a very important religious structure that um, um, only certain people had access to. Um, uh, the, 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 the temple held the sacred fire, which was you know, just uh, basically sort of a, a, a gift. I, I don't understand fully Natchez religion. I'm not gonna pretend that I'm an expert, but just sort of as my understanding is sort of the, the sacred fire, basically the sort of embodiment of, of, of kind of celestial spiritual powers. So that mound we know was used for that act, for those religious activities. Mound D, the mound kind of in the middle there, that was actually 
the supported the house of the Natchez chief. So that's where the Natchez chief and his family lived. There's nothing like nobody buried in them or anything like that. You know? Mound C actually had a number of burials in it. Okay. Um, the the um, the floor of the temple, the temple was used to store the remains of um, uh, past Natchez sons, and some of those individuals were buried in the floor of the temple. Okay. And so, in 1930, uh, when excavations were taking place, there actually a number of um, uh, a number of individuals that were buried in Mound C were excavated and removed, and all of those folks had been buried with um, lots of trade goods. So there were lots of French items that were uh, that were buried with them. So they built the temple and then buried them in the temple floor. In that case, yes. Mm -hmm. But all of these Mississippian mounds were used to support some kind of building. Okay. And special building could be a chief's house, could be sort of a council house, could be a Religious structure. Is that a common use of the mound? During Mississippian times, yes. Okay. So from ballpark 80, 1,000 up to 80, 1,700, yes. Prior to that, mounds were used for lots of different purposes that did not include supporting structures for the most part. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the mound that you found, Mound E, how big did it end up being? I mean, you, you looked like you had a pretty good profile on it. So that's a good question, um, and I don't know that I have a scale to figure it out. Um, you're asking me a question I can't answer right now. Uh, it's in the report. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were able to do um, kind of coring across the top of it and kind of figure out its east, west, north, south, I honestly, I can't give that answer right now. It was, um, um, it seemed appropriate size relative to the other mounds. Um, one thing that was kind of cool about, or, or several things that were pretty cool about the mound E excavations. I, the strategy in the field was to kind of try to get a unit that would come down on the top of the mound and a unit that would come down at the base of the mound. When I say that, you got to understand, I'm standing on a flat surface, six feet above a deeply buried mound, and just kind of hoping we're going to hit the top <laughs> and, and the edge. And by God, we hit the top and the edge. <laughs> it, was, it was really kind of uh, exceptional. Um, and one really cool thing about the top of that mound, that mound summit, it's not deeply buried. Uh, if you think about it, you've got some the sides of a mound slope up. You've got the, the top is obviously higher than the bottom. <clears throat> the top of that mound, um, uh, in the center of that, that image, there is a, a, a colleague from the University of Pennsylvania, Meg Kassebaum. Meg is sitting on the surface of one of those of, of, of that sort of topmost layer of, of mound construction, um, and you can see she's a, sitting on a surface that's only about 25 centimeters below the current ground surface. So that mound slopes up. And the top of that mound is actually relatively shallowly buried. It could be reached using traditional archaeological techniques. Um, that, that kind of surprised us. Uh, that it would be that easy to sort of, uh, that it would be that shallow. Another cool thing about the mound excavations is we actually caught the corner, of, one of the corners of the mound. We caught the southwest corner of the mound. And you can see up there, we've kind of got, um, there's sort of a, Curve in the in the upper left part of that image. That's the edge of the mound. Like we caught, we caught the very corner of the mound. I couldn't couldn't believe that. So we were able to trace that slope all the way down. This was a, a mound that had a flat top, and it was sort of rectangular or square. Or? Yep, rectangular. Yep, flat top, rectangular, with a build actually with building on um, on the summit of the mound. And and once again, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> that small unit we were able to sort of get on top of the mound, we actually found a piece of architecture there. We found a piece of a building. And you can see in front of Meg in that slide right there, there's a there's a trench that's kind of running mm -hmm. right there. That's actually a wall trench. That, that's, a, that's a wall trench from a building. So ballpark AD 1450, someone dug a trench on top of that mound and then the, the, the upright posts that would have made the wall of a, of a structure were then set into that trench. 
And so we were able to sort of find a piece of that wall trench. So able to figure out that there was a building on top of this mound. And actually because of that wall trench, we were able to figure out how it was oriented, like which sort of which direction the walls were oriented toward. And that, that orientation is actually the same orientation of some other mound top buildings that were excavated there in the 1960s. So we're able to kind of relate this structure to some of those structures as well. Did you find evidence of the French use of that mound? Because they had stuff cannons on it, right? Or was that, was this is the mound that had the cannons on it, and we did not find. So everything we excavated was fully pre-contact uh, before the French showed up. So this side, so we don't know sort of what happened to those <coughs> layers of the mound that were there when, when the French occupied it. It's possible that those were sort of eroded and, and kind of destroyed between 1730 and whenever the mounds were covered with silt in the, in the, in the mid 1800s. Um, it's possible that folks sort of maybe plowing in the area plowed over the top. We, we don't sort of know, but we were not able to find any context associated with the 18th century for this mound. But we know because of its location and we know because of the location of the other missing mound that this, this has to be the mound that, the, um, that those, that those uh, cannons were on. The one French artifact we found was a, a clay pipe stem, uh, a kaolin pipe, and it was located in a layer of soil that looked like it was um, basically soil that had washed down the slope of the mound. It was all kind of mixed up and, and tumbled, and what we were sort of speculating is that that may have sort of washed down from the top of the mound, or at least from the slope of the mound, and it kind of ended up in this context right here, like just above the intact pre-contact deposit there that we found now. So that is, that and one wrought iron nail are the only uh, European artifacts that we were able to find. All right, another question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you were actually doing this excavation or any of the excavations you were doing, you, you, you showed pictures of the Natchez descendants today. Were any of them around at the time, or have they, you know, like, have they given a reaction to what you found here? Is, is it has it been valuable to them, or is that still an ongoing process? So we did not uh, consult with the Natchez before we did this. Um, we we reached out to uh, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians. We reached out to uh, Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma uh, when we were applying for the grant. Um, and really, I don't know there were anybody's reaction yet because I'm literally working on the report right now, so we haven't really sort of gotten that information out there yet. So there hasn't been, um, there hasn't been an opportunity to really sort of share this with uh, any of the descendant communities so far. But I'd be curious, I'd definitely be curious to, to what they would have to say. Like I said, especially since the Natchez, this is a still place, still a place where the Natchez uh, descendants come to. Yeah. So are the Natchez a, a, a legal entity now? I mean, were they, are they a recognized tribe of the federal They're government? They're not federally recognized. Um, and there are sort of multiple, I know there's a, there's a descendant community that lives near Gore, Oklahoma, and I think those are the folks that come back to uh, the Grand Village. I know the, the Muscogee Creek, um, some Natchez ended up with them, and the Muscogee Creek uh, descendants um, are, are very interested in uh, sort of this project and, um, and sort of the, I guess what will we'll ultimately be sort of the, the information that comes out of this project. But the Natchez themselves are not a, um, are not a federally, federally recognized group. And essentially after that, 1731 uh, battle at Sicily, battle, surrender and sort of escape at Sicily Island, the, the, the remaining Natchez groups more or less became on, those that weren't sold into slavery basically became enclaves living among much larger nations like the Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Wind Creek. <coughs> Any other questions for Dr. Boudreaux? Thank y'all for coming tonight. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Thank you.